Howdy YouTube. You're looking at the insides of the IBM Personal Computer 340 that I unboxed in a previous video. You can see we have this all set up ready to get to work. What I'm going to do is add a couple cards. I'm going to add an audio card and we're going to add a PCI card. Now the purpose of this video series is to put OS2 Warp 3.0 Connect on this machine. So OS2 Warp had a very select number of audio cards, sound cards that would work with. One of them has drivers available still and I'll point that out here it is the Ensonic Audio PCI card. Now if you can read the chip there, hopefully that's focused enough for you. It's an ES1371 chip. Now these Ensonic Audio PCI cards were made over many years and they included different chipsets numbered 1371, 1370, uh, 1370, 1373. Now the OS2 drivers only really work with the ES1371 chipset so that's why I had to hunt down this card. Now in order to get my speakers to work which are USB powered speakers we're going to put in this VIA chipset now USB is really not used it's not used by OS2 at least not the original OS2 eventually there were USB drivers for OS2 but it didn't start out that way so we're going to put the PCI card the um, USB card in I wasn't crazy about the VIA chipset for the USB, but this is all I had at the moment. Since I'm only using it for power to a USB port, hopefully this will work just fine. So I already cleared the slot blank to the PCI port on this side. We'll get that in. And IBM used slotted screws. I'm not crazy about it, but they're all slotted throughout the system. They're a lot harder to manage for me. You can see. I'm having trouble already. Finding the damn screw hole. This is embarrassing, isn't it? would be if it were you. Let's see if I can start this with my fingers. Yeah, there we go. Finally. Okay nice and secure. Now the other PCI slot is on the other side of this riser board. To get to that, to get to install anything, there is a plate holding the slot blanks in on this side. So we're going to have to remove this screw here. Once that plate is loose, all of the slot blanks are loose. So 
So we're going to pull one out, hopefully without disturbing the other two underneath. We're going to grab our audio card here. And we're going to stick it in. Let's clear some space. Is it the first one or is it the second one it's going to have to go into? There's some space out of the way. It is the first one. Okay, good. There we go. So that is in. Now the trick is to get this plate back in place without without disturbing those slot blanks lower down. That is a weird fit. I don't like that. Can't get that any better here. Okay. This is not going as well as it should. See if I can get a better angle on it this way. There we go. It's not perfect, but it's going to have to do. The problem, I don't know if it's so visible, is there's not enough of a gap in between the PCI board and the, uh, the the backing plate for the little lip on this to fully seat well but I can get it in close enough to get the screw in here not the perfect fit but it certainly should hold everything in place and that's the point of the system they have IBM has here with this case. It's not great. Could be a lot. It could be engineered a little better than this. But that's what we have to work with. So we have the audio card in place. We have the USB card in place. Everything else pretty much staying the same. So let's get the cover back on this. That's it. Yeah, it feels feels good all around. Okay, that should do it. Okay, we got a couple of extra slot blanks. 
put those down. Now let's see. I'm going to turn this up on its side here. So that's the way it's going to have to operate. Now, I do have OS2 Warp Connect, the bonus pack, and the boot diskettes. The audio card did come with a driver disk, but I don't think we're going to use it because I don't think they put OS2 drivers on the disk, but we'll see. I have the drivers downloaded. Okay, I'm going to cut the video right here, and what we'll do is I'll get this set up with the keyboard and mouse, and we'll be right back. Okay, we're back YouTube and we're ready. I have the system all plugged together. We have our installation media right here. So we're going to go for it. I'm going to put the floppy in the floppy disk drive. Turn the computer on. And see what happens. Now let's get the warp, where is the warp disk? It's not in there. Oh crud. I think I know where I left the warp disk. <laughs> I gotta go get it. Okay. We shall, well you know what, let's turn this on the screen. Because eventually it will come up with the OS2 boot here off the floppies. While I go get, <laughs> uh, try and get the uh, disc out of where it is. One moment. We'll just do this. It'll take me a few minutes to get the CD out of where it is, the drive it's in. So bear with me. Just have to open up a DVD drive, a CD ROM drive, in a different computer that's not plugged in. There we go. Sorry about that. So let's see if we can get this CD-ROM drive in the CD, the CD-ROM disk in the drive. That's what I meant to say. I'm gonna flip these two little catches so we can use this drive vertically. There we go. Now, there we go, <laughs> just in time. Fantastic. That drive is a little hummy, isn't it? Okay, we're going to go for advanced installation. We're going to accept the drive.
and hopefully it'll ask us to format it. Yes, format the partition. And we're going to choose the HPFS file system for performance reasons. HPFS was a file system developed by Microsoft employees for OS2 back when OS2 was a joint project between Microsoft and IBM back in 1988 or 89. It was first available, first made available, I believe, with OS2 1.2. It could have been 1.1, but I think it was 1.2. No, it was 1.1. I'd have to look that up. I, now I'm tempted to say 1.1, OS2 1.1. It allowed uh, greater uh, file names, greater size file names. It broke the 8.3 DOS barrier for file names, allowing 256, 255 character file names. And what else did it have? Um, it uh, had built-in features that fought fragmentation that placed files close together. And what else did it do? It did a number of other things. Uh, it allowed for extended attributes so files could have metadata for the first time and the operating system could use that metadata you know, however uh, the developers felt it was needed to be used. <laughs> and users could use that metadata. You could place, oh, uh, descriptions of files in the extended attributes. You could, uh, it held uh, MIME type data, I believe, so applications knew what files belonged to what applications. So this part, the first part of the install goes pretty quickly, really just copying the base of the operating system onto the hard drive. After this, we will reboot, and there are at least two other portions of the installation, um, the first being most of the graphical part of the operating system, uh, the remainder of the operating system, that is, and the networking components. Now, it does recognize this 3M ISA Ethernet card, but we're not going to be using it, at least not yet, not for a little while, because OS2 back in 1994-95 did not ship with a DHCP client, or at least not one that, that works with uh, modern routers. I don't believe it actually had a DHCP client when it shipped. That was made available a little later through fix packs, which we'll get into eventually. Right now we're just going to do the installation of OS2 and leave it at that. And then the next video we'll be going into configuring OS2, getting the audio drivers and the video drivers loaded, applying fix packs, what it took day to day, you know, day to day maintenance and running of OS2, which if you did this in the past, in the 90s, when it was current, you got a lot more experience that readied readied me for the world of Linux. Finding, you know, being conscious of hardware limited driver support and a hardware, finding hardware that works with the operating system is a chore that Windows users and especially Mac users don't really have to deal with. Mac users don't deal with it at all. Um, but Windows users do have to find drivers if they're not um, 
if they didn't buy the hardware new. If you buy hardware new, it comes with Windows drivers. There's no reason to go hunting for them. Okay, so let's remove the diskette and press enter. We can put these up out of the way a little bit. And we should start booting into, well, the rest of OS2's installation. Now this monitor isn't really appropriate to the time of OS2 Warp. One, it's an LCD, and two, it's a widescreen. Neither one were, well, uh, LCDs might have been on the market back then, but they were probably about ten grand. I think LCD screens were actually on the market back then, but they were so high-end that you didn't see them. It, as a normal person, he didn't see them. Okay, we're getting into our setup program here. Cool. Now, it did detect, or at least it gave us the brand of the logic, uh, the display adapter. That's fine. SVGA is what we want it to be. Other CD-ROM support, uh, I believe that's fine. Let's see what our choices are. So we'll just go with non-listed IDE CD-ROM. Now I don't believe we're going to find the right audio driver. Yeah. Had a very limited number of audio drivers built in. We'll do that after installation. So let's say OK here. We're not going to install a printer. Super VGA is fine. That's what we want. OK. We're going to include everything. Now everything is fonts, documentation, system utilities, and we can go in and see more if we want. So we want all of these. All of this is optional. The utilities here are quite a quite a few of them actually. Uh, we certainly want to be able to manage partitions, uh, view pictures. Now their picture viewer is very limited. Uh, create utility disks, of course we want to do that. Be able to, of course. Uh, tools and games. Now it comes with Solitaire, Chess, and Mahjong. But we also want an editor, enhanced editor, which is a Editor, a text editor more geared towards uh, programmers. OS2 DOS support, we certainly want that. Win support. Now, this is the Blue Spine Edition, so it does include Windows 3.1 capability, you know, built in. So we want all that. Multimedia, we're going to get the multimedia working, so we want to include it. And let's go ahead and install. Now here's a step. We want to add existing programs to our desktop. If we don't do this, we're not going to get icons created for us automatically on our desktop. So let's go ahead and do that. And we do want to install networking. Eventually we might get there, but we'll see. But uh, I'll install it anyway. Now we only really need the TCP IP. We don't need network client. Um, so. Okay, it has discovered our 
Ethernet card, which is good. So let's go into settings. And OK. All we really had to do was say yes there. TCP IP. Let's see. IP address. I'm just going to create one on my local network. Pretty high up, see if that works. I don't think it will. Host name, we'll just call this warp and install. We can always change those settings later if we happen to get the network really working, but that should just get us enough to get us started. Because we uh, part of the part of the chore <laughs> of maintaining running OS two back in the day, and it applies any time you run it, but is applying fix packs. And the, it's a process, and it can be done, done in a number of ways. The easiest way is if your network card was supported out of the box and configured properly, and OS2 is still a supported product, you could do it online. You could download the updates online over the network the internet and it worked it should have worked I never had broadband in the 90s I never had a working network card under OS 2 I never needed it because I had to use dial-up and OS 2 worked perfectly fine with my external modem I kept external modems because the wind modems the internal ones uh, the, well, wind modems were impossible to get to work in OS2, and internal modems were tricky because of driver issues. External modems are connected to a serial port, they just worked. It, it could be any brand, didn't matter. So I always had an external modem back in the 90s uh, because the modem was totally hardware, it was self contained hardware, and the serial port. You know, every operating system could work a serial port modem. Uh, no problem. Uh, no problem getting online with Linux back in the day in the late 90s with a serial modem. No problem with OS2. No problem with BOS. They all just worked just fine with an a external modem. But um, where was I going with this? Oh, yeah, fix pack installations. Fix packs were distributed by IS, uh, IBM in a couple of different formats. One was as disk images, a series, you know, a collection of disk images, which you had to download each disk image, extract it to a floppy, and then run the setup, the updating setup program from the first floppy, and it would prompt you for the rest. And hopefully your downloads weren't corrupted and your disk writing didn't you know, went well and didn't corrupt the, the disks, and everything worked perfectly. That was one way of doing it, and you always had to have some floppies, you know, at least 10 to 17 floppies lying around to do that, because that's how many floppies it took. The other way was to download all the floppy disk images, extract them into a folder on your hard drive, and run the setup program right from the hard drive. Now that was a lot easier, a lot quicker, you didn't need all the disks, a lot more reliable. And that's the way we're going to be, I'm going to be demonstrating how to apply fix packs to OS2, is that method. Uh, I have all the disk image files archived, I have them on a CD-ROM, be easy enough to pop it into the machine, copy the files to the hard drive, extract them, go about our business, supply the fix packs. So that's what that's the method I'll be using. 
The other method was to download, instead of disk images, download zip files, extract the zip files, and basically run the installation program from the zip files, the extracted zip files. Now, to me, that's no different than extracting disk images. So, I've only archived the disk image, disk images of the fix packs that I need because once you extract them, it, the process is pretty much the same. Use slightly different software. The benefit of the zip files over the disk images is, well, I don't know of any benefit really. The, the disk image files are more flexible because if you wanted to write them to floppy, you could, but you didn't have to. So that's what we'll be doing later on in the process here. As I said, this first video is really just a look at the installation of OS2, the hardware, and uh, the next video will be using OS2, maintaining it. Now, OS2, for a little bit of history, for those who don't know, started development back in 1985-87 right around there I know it was, well it might have been announced in 87 but Microsoft and IBM might have been working on it before then, I don't really know but by 87 IBM and Microsoft released OS2 1.0 didn't include a, a GUI, it was a just a command line operating system, but it was a bit more robust, quite a bit more robust than DOS. Required a, more resources, uh, could run, could multitask OS2 programs, couldn't OS, uh, multitask DOS programs, could run one DOS program at a time back then. OS2 1.1 came out, added, I believe, the HPFS file system for larger hard disk support, better, more efficient hard disk space management, more file name options, other features like that. It also included uh, OS2 Presentation Manager, which maybe one day I'll be able to get, a, we'll do an installation of OS2 1.3, just to get a look at Presentation Manager, which followed very closely the Windows uh, 3 look or the Windows, even the window, it might have even been Windows 2 look. And then Presentation Manager under OS 2 1.3 followed the Windows 3 look. So, very similar looking. Uh, structure, in, internally they were quite different of course, but on the, on the surface they looked similar. Okay, now OS2, the installation, now we're doing 3.0 here, which remains my favorite version of OS2. I've tried OS2 2.0, or 2.1, to be, excuse me, to be more accurate. Uh, I've used OS2 Warp 4.0, and 3 was my, is, remains my favorite. 4 was nice because it, it was better with some newer, more current hardware back in 95, 96, but I prefer the look and feel of the icons, the, just the overall look and feel of Warp 3.0. Okay, Warp Connect installation. Now, this was available on floppies to install. If it's taking this long from uh, CD-ROM, imagine how much longer a floppy installation of OS2 Warp would take. Now, I don't know if Warp Connect was available on floppies. I think Warp Connect was 
CD-ROM released only, but the original, the regular version of Warp, just OS2 Warp 3.0, was definitely available on floppies first. That's how I had to install it when I first bought it. Now eventually I bought the CD-ROM of Warp 3 Connect. This, I believe the disc I'm installing off of is, well, I have several, a couple copies of OS2 Warp over the years I've collected. Ah, well restart automatically, okay. Um, but I believe this particular disc is one of my originals that I bought back in 1995. Now I have an unopened copy of Warp 3 Connect Blue Spine. I have an open copy of Warp 3 Connect Red Spine. And those I purchased after the fact as collector collectible items just to have a a nice reference, um, you know, pristine reference copy. <laughs> I don't know. We can see the driver is loaded for the Ethernet card. Of course, it's not going to find, it's not going to be able to make an Ethernet connection because there's no cable. But at least the driver is right. Recognize the card. There's one error. As I said, eventually we may be able to get this OS2 warp online. I'm not particularly hopeful and it won't happen too soon, but it might. At least having the Ethernet adapter recognized and the driver loads correctly, it's a good start. Once we apply the TCP IP and the network card, the, the drivers updated, uh, apply the fix packs for those. Who knows, maybe the DHC will, will be included in one of those TCP IP fix packs. And if it is, we might just be able to get this online without too much trouble. What we'll be able to do online is next to nothing because the browser in Warp was, well, now it's ancient. Then it was, even when it was released, Web Explorer was a pathetic browser. Okay. Okay, Warp Connect has completed. Pretty darn cool. Let's reboot the system. I'll remember to take the CD-ROM drive out of the CD-ROM disk out of the drive this time. So I'm not stuck in the same situation as I was today. Because we should not need the installation CD in there any longer. I'm debating if I should install the bonus pack. Yeah, let's do that. Let's install the bonus pack. Give you some idea what that's like. We, we don't we won't need the fix packs around for that yeah network is unreachable I know I know I know and I know that error is there. So here we have our SVGA desktop. 
I know we'll we'll install the graphics drivers, but we have to do fix packs, I believe, before the graphics drivers. But here is the OS2 Warp 3 desktop. We have our launch pad, which is what OS um, IBM called this dock, basically. It's called the launch pad. And you can see the icon is running. The indication that it's running are the lines through the icon. And we just cover up the icon with the actual launch pad. And we can shut down. We can lock the computer from here. Find, I believe it's just like search. Uh, uh, this camera is driving me crazy. Hopefully it'll stay focused. Find is just a search and find feature. Window list, if you have uh, programs running, the desktop is running, it's a program. The launch pad is running, it's a program. Would be here. Now if you notice the window controls, you have a maximize and a minimize. And then you have a control here. Double clicking on that left widget will close the, the window. MPTS is the name for the multi IBM Multiport Transport Services. Basically the drivers for network cards and their setup. So we're not going to be doing that right now. OS2 system is where most of what you will be using day to day resides. You have a link to your drives. You have a link to command prompts. So we have OS2 window, which looks a lot like a DOS window. And when you try to close it graphically, you get this warning. You have a full screen OS2. There you go. And if you just exit from this, you should be back at the desktop. There you go. DOS full screen, DOS window. As I said, OS2 includes at least a blue spine, a blue spine, the blue spine edition includes the Win Windows 3.1 built in. So let's take a look at that. Hmm. I thought it locked up on me, but it was just taking its sweet time. <laughs> so here you have your Windows 3. Uh, Win OS 2 session, and you can see it looks a lot like Windows. I didn't want to minimize that. Now. The minimize windows viewer is where your minimize programs go. <laughs> there we go. That's the button I wanted. So you have all your basic Windows 3.1 programs that come with Windows, and you can run your Windows software. It's pretty cool. When you close it, you're ending your OS2, Win OS2 session. And you notice now it's no longer minimized. It's no longer in our minimized Windows viewer. See, a folder also gets those lines when the folder is open. Pretty cool. So here are the games. System setup is a whole bunch of I guess what you could call control panels, system clock, keyboard, selective install, device driver install, those are special system itself. If we open the system, you can see here is where we set our resolution. We don't have a whole lot of choice. 
we can set our settings like do we want to confirm on delete folder delete do we want to confirm on file delete confirm on rename of files with extensions so you can change the behavior here prompt for appropriate action when you try to rename a file with the already named file set the window uh, preferences here you can enable or disable animation Minimize window behavior, minimize window to viewer. You can minimize it to desktop as well. And here there are pages, so there are, in the window tab there are actually multiple pages. Folder automatic close. Automatically close a folder view when opening objects contained within. Now, it's set to never by default your desktop will get very crowded. I'll leave it at that for the time being. Default folder view is icon view, which is fine, but if you like tree or details, you can change that here. Enable or disable type ahead, okay. Print screen is enabled. Logo is shown for two seconds and you can change the icon or the title of this particular system control panel. You can see along the left side here are what are supposed to be a graphic for uh, a binding uh, paper binder and pages. These settings are what's called settings books and every object has them whether it's a, you know a document file if you go to settings here are the settings for the document file same concept a book format with tabs and pages you can see OS2 comes with a lot of documentation if you install it which we did Add programs. If you have a program on your on a floppy disk, you can start the install of the program here. More than likely, you want to use the setup program that came with the setup. Actually, add programs might be adding program icons to the desktop. I'd have to revisit that. Spooler is your print spooler. Country setting, sound, fonts power for laptop users, scheme palette, color palette, mix palettes, the change, color settings and schemes. Now under scheme palette you have quite a few schemes to choose from. Let's try one. Yeah, okay, so let's try this scheme. Drag item to target window, hold Alt key for system default change. Okay, so we're going to hold the Alt key and drag this. Now drag is with the right button, not the left button. Ooh, that marble looks awful. But you can see the... You can see the change. So it changed the background, it changed the color schemes of the window borders. Let's try night music. Now once we got the graphics drivers installed, these might look a, quite a bit better. So let's go back to default, because that's actually the most soothing to my eye. But that's how you go ahead and change the look and feel in one fell swoop. You can change any of the settings within any of the schemes, the palette schemes, to whatever you want and create your own look. You can create your own look within each folder. 
if you have startup programs that are running, they'll be in the startup folder. You can place icons of programs you want to start up with the system right here as well. Under productivity, we have the regular system editor, the enhanced, the search for files basically, an icon editor, pulse which is almost useless, it's a teeny little pulse monitor of the CPU. Yeah. Clipboard viewer for if I copy and paste the text and picture viewer. If you want to install or remove components of warp you can do that through here. Warp selective install, selective uninstall if you want to get rid of something. TCP remove, okay, warp connect remote install. So if you are on a network and you wanted to install over the network you could do that. Yep. Pretty good. Okay. This has run long enough so I'm not going to go into the bonus pack. I will show you just a little bit more here. Now when you open up the drive view the default is this tree. If you double click on the drive you'll get a window view, an icon view. If I right click anywhere in here and go to settings this is the settings for this folder. Okay, I always like a fluid icon setting much nicer than the non-float or non-grid. Small size is fine with me. If you choose invisible you will not see your icons. Not a good choice. Let's see. You can set backgrounds for each and every uh, let's, uh, let's go with solid color. There we go. You can set backgrounds if you want. That's pretty gray, isn't it? <laughs> Let's go back to white. Okay. OS2 Warp OS2 uses config sys as its primary configuration or its initial configuration file for your operating system. This is something we can get into later as well. Uh, it is a text file. And when you open it up it's a lot bigger than DOS's config sys. Whoops, I want to scroll down too far. But it loads drivers, sets up in, uh, environment variables, and sets the shell and uh, tells OS2 where to hold its desktop settings, basically in these two files two INI files, very important for your system. PM shell is the name of the GUI basically. That's what's providing your graphical user interface is PM shell.exe. Uh, it does auto start or it sets the shell to CMDEXE which is OS2's command line and it then runs, let's see, auto starts programs, task list, folders. This is a setting that one could change. You could remove programs, task list, folders, connections. You could remove all of that from auto start. 
because say you run a program and that program is causing problems and every time you restart that program restarts you might want to edit your OS to config sys and remove the word programs and that way it won't restart the next auto start the next time you restart and you have a chance to diagnose the problem very handy to be able to do that set the lib path and the path statements here d path is for dll so i'm not so sure why there's a d path and a lib path but they're both basically library paths um, so So there you go, that's a quick and dirty look at the config sys. You can see there are backups of config sys. 000, MPT, TCP. Now these are backups done of config sys during installation. It was always a good idea. Anytime you changed config sys, back it up first, number it, 001, 002, whatever is the next in line make your changes, try to reboot, see if your changes worked. If they didn't, revert back to the last saved good config sys file. So there you go. Quick and dirty look at OS 2 Warp 3.0. In future videos we will get more in depth with Warp. But I hope you enjoyed this so far. Next video on Warp will be fix packs and device drivers. So look forward for that. Bye bye.